think I am on if someone could verify that Susan or someone else if you can just make sure you can both see <clears throat> and hear me okay that would be helpful So am I visible and can you hear me, folks? J. Scott McLean says I'm five by five. So there's one promising vote. And now I've got some stuff in the live chat that that looks good. Okay, um, so kind of bear with me for a second. We're not going to start yet. I need to do a couple things for Susan. And because people like me are notoriously awful at multitasking, I may not be super engaging right now because I gotta do something with the night bot thing. So Susan, I am on the night bot thing. I am parting the channel and it's leaving. And then I'm gonna rejoin it now that we've started the live stream. Hopefully that is correct. So now it's done, now I'm joining it. And then I need to figure out how to add Amanda Joe. Okay, I think it's I think it's on, Susan. Let me know if it works okay on your end. And then Yeah. Technology. And now I need to figure out so let's just do one thing at a time, Susan. Is that does that look good on your end, Susan? Do you have is the Nightbot thing working? And I'm just looking at the live chat for your response. Hello, everyone else that's joining us. Give us a minute to uh, futz with a few things here and get the show up and running optimally. Okay. And while I'm waiting for Susan to let me know about that. I will next attempt with my technologically challenged brain uh, to find an email from Susan that will let me connect. Oh, wait, I think I know the easy way. Isn't the easy way to find Amanda Joe and then just yeah, okay, I think this will work. So Oh, maybe it doesn't do it in OBS. Maybe I need to open it up in YouTube. So many things going on here, team. NASA control. Mission control. Um Okay, let's go out of this and go into this and this and this. Okay. So maybe this will work better. All right. I'm in YouTube live and I see Amanda Joe. So I'm going to try to add her as a moderator. All right, Susan and Lisa and Amanda Joe. I think I just did two things and I hope I did them well. I think the little night bot thing is added. So maybe let me know. Oh, sweet. Susan says it's working. So I'm one for two. And the second thing I tried to do was add Amanda Joe as a moderator. So Amanda Joe, if you can just type something in the live chat, we should see a little blue wrench next to your name. It lets us know you've got you've got the power, right? Yeah, Nightbot isn't a real person. It's sort of a I don't know. Susan can explain it. I defer to her for some of these more technical things. So we got Susan and Lisa there. Amanda Joe, if you're there and if you can just type something like hi, then I'll be able to see if Yep, sweet. Awesome. Ha! two for two don't get cocky uh, it could go sideways at any point um, okay so yeah we've got about seven minutes before we'll get officially started here uh, so great to see so many folks in the team on here 
Now we got three awesome people with little blue wrenches by their name so they can help moderate the live chat. They can add, uh, Amanda Jo especially can add if she has links or whatever. Um, and she may be somewhat limited in what she can do. And it's probably pretty new to her. So we'll, we'll let Lisa and Susan do the heavy lifting if that's okay. But um, yeah, we'll see what she can chime in with. And Amanda Jo, you're welcome to also uh, I'll keep my phone on if you message me I can check there as well so a few shout outs to folks while we're get, waiting to get started uh, let me scroll back I do remember seeing that Germany was in the house so that's great and let me get for we got Scotland Elizabeth from Scotland we've got Jan from Denver uh, Christina from North Bay Ontario California we have Catherine from Philadelphia, um, Eric from Belgium, and I'm likely to miss folks, just be patient with me, I appreciate it. Giles from the Netherlands, trying to catch up. Charles from Chino Hills, California, Mirren from West Australia, Lynn from Volcano Island, Terry from Waverly, Tennessee, Hallie from Ireland, Pete from Spain, Joe Perry from Iceland, um, Gail from Georgia, Hans from Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, Jay Noswicks from Santa Cruz, California, Theo from Sweden, Aaron from Arizona, Samia from Algiers, I hope that's right, Megan from Salt Lake City, uh, Estrame from Iceland, if I butcher your name I apologize, Frey from Denmark, Let's see, now we've got, I'm a, a few minutes behind here, but I think I can catch up. Let's see, Ulrike from Austria, Anna from Finland. If you're watching this as a, a recording and not live, then you might skip ahead about five minutes, and that's when the, the show will actually start. And I'll be sure to add little chapter marks uh, so you can sort of navigate the live stream a, a little bit. Uh, Sifer Voss from South Africa, Jeffrey from New York State, Bob from upstate New York. And what else do we have here? Steve from Grand Prairie, Texas. Sven from Germany. Eighth Day, hello Mission Control from Liverpool. Jack from Santa Monica, California. Uh, let's see, I'm almost cut up. Bill from Auburn, Washington. Stein from Oslo, Norway. Idaho Turtle from outside Boise, Dennis from Montana, Frank from Oregon, Dale from the whale from Wales, Vera from Dallas, Carrie from Finland, Mark from Arizona, Ross from the UK, Lee Pennsylvania, uh, Amanda in Twin Falls, Idaho. Hey, I'm in the same place. Can I do a shout out of my own? Hey, I'm Sean from Twin Falls, Idaho. There we go. That felt pretty good. John from Kansas, Ann from Reno, John from Tallahassee, Joan from Washington State. Meredith, North Carolina, I'm missing some people. Deborah from West Virginia, Storm Chaser, Pennsylvania. Uh, Bob from Alberta, Maria from Manchester, England. Uh, okay, now I gotta scroll back down. Maria from Spain, Agneta from Stockholm, Katrina from Tucson, Nikolai from Germany, Laura, England, Rena from Cal or California, Slipstreaming, oh, Annie from Austin. Glenn and Debbie from Winnipeg, greetings. Anne from South Africa, Kevin from Santa Fe, Kelly, Queensland, Susan from Toodle, Washington, Jesse from Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, oh, sometimes this, the live chat just like moves down quickly and then you just totally lose where you are, which is distracting. Uh, quick shout out to those that, are, that have donated with the, whatever that is, the thanks or whatever it is. So Stephen Hess, Oh, now I can't see all the different little names there. Um, Berenico. Yeah, I want to make sure. T. Jenkins, thanks so much for uh, donating to the channel. This is all a labor of love, um, but definitely that helps, and especially it helps me get out and make some of the field videos um, and do some other things. Andrew from Fort Worth, Jay Ferraro from Michigan, 
Uh, Jay Scott from Kingsgate, Washington. I'm missing a ton of people here, team. I apologize. But you can see it. Uh, but it's always nice to get the vocal recognition, I suppose. Penny from Ohio. Ian from Portsmouth. Lowell from Dallas. Erla from Iceland. Paul from California. Vince from Switzerland. Pamela from Dorset, UK. Davina O'Teal from the Netherlands. Sue from Waterloo, Canada. Leggy, Leggy Maggie, that's fun, from West Virginia. Ruth from Finland. Kobe from France. Uh, Magda from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, Leonardo from Brazil. John, Ontario. Optimus from Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, Stephen from Taft, California. Joe from Concord. Jack from Washington. Jed from Atlanta. Andrew from Cumbria, West Cumbria, UK. Um, yeah, and make sure, thank you for someone reminding me, uh, the like and the subscribing thing is always important. Make sure the little bell button is filled in for the subscribe thing. Uh, that's super helpful. Um, helps with the algorithm. I don't know what happens in YouTube world, right? Like, I don't know. I just, I'm a geologist, right? I'm just, I can barely run the live stream. I certainly don't know how all this works, but it's fun nonetheless. Kim from Ohio and from South Wales, UK. Maybe another minute or so. We'll get started. Therese from the Netherlands. Cheryl from South Carolina. Rosemary from Kennewick. Oh, it just jumped down again. Dog on it. Sean from Lancashire, England. Andrew from Lincoln, UK. Claire from Y Valley, England. Laura, San Antonio. I'm. There's literally so many people jumping on, which is great. That I, I'm going to have to give up here in a second. Frank from Spokane. Sally from Leeds. Um, let's do a couple more. Let's find Annemiek from Netherlands. Hildor from Iceland. And one more real quick. So, And Connie's Little Corner from Arizona. Thank you, Connie. Uh, sweet. Okay, let's go ahead and get the show started. So, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me, part of the geo-learning team here on my YouTube channel. My name is Sean Wilsey. I am a geology professor. I'm happy to join you for this update on Iceland and what's been happening there. We've been doing these pretty regularly since early November. I think I'd have to go back and check, but maybe November 3rd was the first uh, update. I can't remember if it was a video or a live stream, but we I alternate between doing live streams and doing the video updates. I'll try to start doing a live stream maybe once every two weeks or so, maybe once every week. We'll just kind of see how it goes. I have a real full-time job as a geology professor here at the College of Southern Idaho. That's obviously my focus, but this has become a tremendously fun and rewarding side gig, I guess, or just passion project is... Um, meeting and working with and learning with so many people from all over the world that are just as passionate and interested in learning geology as I am. Um, there's lots of geological topics out there that could be explored. Um, I can't, I don't have the, the brain capacity and the bandwidth to tackle all of them. So I appreciate you jumping on here and focusing on the things that I'm really interested in, which would be Iceland, a country I've come to love having visited there um, four times. And also we've looked a little bit at Kilauea on the Big Island, which I've been to about six times. And then most of my channel, if you get in there and dig into the trenches, uh, has a lot of field-based videos. So me actually going out, finding really cool geologic features, geologic stories, and then showing and explaining those as best I can. That's, that's kind of how this YouTube channel started. And now it's morphed into, uh, to some degree, these live streams sitting at my office, not outside, not looking at rocks, but still exploring cool landscapes and cool geologic features remotely with with the uh, all the great advances in technology. So let me get my notes here and we will get started. But thanks for joining me today. If you're catching this on a recording, that's great. Thanks for joining us. Feel free to leave comments on YouTube. Uh, you can also see the live chat stuff going on there want to do a quick shout out to our moderators. We've got, I guess we have four moderators now. We have the non-human Nightbot <laughs> moderator. Uh, we have Susan Helmer, who's uh, been great and helpful to, in helping me set this up as this has grown exponentially. It wasn't that many weeks ago that a live chat with me 
which was run totally by me, had, you know, a couple hundred people. I remember when it got to like 700, I thought, oh boy, this is maybe getting a little bit big. And, and now it's well over, you know, it, it's into the thousands, which is, which is great. We're growing, growing our learning community uh, over time, which is fantastic. Um, also, Amanda Jo, who is our, our Iceland contact, she is a Grindavik resident that's been displaced, unfortunately, by all the events that have transpired since early November. Uh, she's doing well, adapting and coping the best she can, hoping to hear good news today from the government. We'll get to that here in a bit, but she's also been added as a moderator. So uh, she's on the live chat. Uh, she might be busy out doing things for the day, but she'll pop in and contribute as much as she can. And she's the one who sends me, you know, it was, e it was pretty easy for me to come in this morning, morning my time, and um, she's already sent me an email with a bunch of links. She's got them organized chronologically. Uh, she's amazing. So I wanna just thank all the, the real troopers in there that, that do the great work for us. Uh, also want to give a quick shout out to Ace10. He's on the live stream as well. Um, it's his name is E Y S T S T E I N N, but it's pronounced Ace10, and I hope I'm getting that right. And he sent me a nice email. He lives on the Reykjanes Peninsula, and he sent me a little bit of information about what's going on there with the the water supply and such. So, so let's go ahead and get started. The way we'll we'll do this here, team, is I probably won't be paying a lot to the live chat um, because I'll be focusing on presenting some of the data and some of the different things I have planned for us today. Uh, Susan and other moderators will handle any questions that you pose. So you guys are free on the live chat to talk to each other, to discuss things. Uh, we just ask that you stay stay on topic, be civil, be respectful. All those basic you know, kindergarten rules apply uh, and they're there to make sure, the moderators are there to make sure that uh, things are pretty much on, on point there. If you have questions though, Susan, we'll let you know how you can ask those. And then once I wrap up my update here on the situation in Iceland at the end, uh, I'll, she'll send me those questions and then I'll address those questions as best I can. So awesome. Let's go ahead and get started. Thanks again for joining me. So here's, here it is. This is, uh, you know, we had an eruption yesterday and what we're going to do at the beginning here is sort of unpack yesterday's eruption on February 8th. Today, of course, is February 9th, about 9 a.m. here, Mountain Standard Time, 4 p.m. in Iceland. Um, the eruption is, I'd say it's, if it's not officially over, it's, it's darn close. Uh, you can see the webcam there, the live shot, uh, the fresh lava field, one of the vents there. This was a vent that was throwing out, you know, clots of lava hundreds of meters into the air yesterday early morning and now that eruption is largely done I would say um, we don't expect any any renewed activity in the next couple of days from this this event so let's look at maybe one more one more view one more webcam that shows just a couple different views um, but yes yeah, the idea here is all the glowing incandescent lava for the most part has solidified. I, I don't doubt if you flew over this with a drone uh, and we weren't able to use our good friends at Nature Eye this time to capture any drone imagery. We'll try to do that on the next eruption when that may occur. Um, but I have no doubts if you flew over it, you would see some a few glowing spots of lava here and there. So is there molten rock at the surface as we look at that image? Absolutely. But is it actively moving? Is it actively being erupted from the vents? I think that activity is largely slowed down. But the nice thing about um, coming to an eruption or coming to a live stream the day after an eruption is yesterday, I just come in, it was early in the morning. I was obviously just trying to catch up to everything. Amanda Joe had a, done a great job of organizing everything with an email there, but I was still, you know, it was a very, you know, organic experience. I didn't have a whole lot planned. I didn't have a whole lot that I'd been able to look at. So I was seeing everything pretty much live with the rest of you. But now that we're a day uh, beyond that event, it's a little bit easier to uh, look at some of the cool imagery and some of the things that came out from that event. So, um, so we can look at some of the cool videos that were here. So this was sent to me by Amanda Joe. This is from a news station here and this is just an exceptionally great video 
that shows the lava flow from this eruptive vent yesterday on February 8th. You can see the power plant over here to the right. So this is looking to the south. This is the road that runs from the, the capital region and the airport down to Grindavik between these hills here. This is Thorbjorn. Uh, this one is, I think this is Hagafelt or this might be, oh, this is Seelingerfeld, this hill here. And you can see the flows coming across the roadway. Uh, you can also see just beyond this tongue of lava, there's another road. That's the road that goes into the Blue Lagoon and the power plant. So we'll, we'll let this run a little bit. It's almost an eight minute clip, so we might, we might jump around a little bit. Um, but you can really see the speed of the main flow channel right down the center there as it works its way over the road. A little bit of black smoke there as the lava starts burning up the asphalt. So that's why you're seeing that different color there. Uh, it's burning up the, the oils and such that are in the asphalt. And then you can see the lava at the far right here starting to fill a little channel. So interestingly, oh, and one other thing that's nice in this view is you can also see the, the protective berm, the wall, the barrier that they have built around the power plant just over here. So fortuitously this lava flow didn't even get up really against the berm for the most part it stayed along this roadway and started following a pre-existing little low uh, channel between older ancient lava flows so we'll watch this a little bit here just really great imagery there you can see the little bursts of uh, flames coming out. That's again the, the roadway and some of the flammable, flammable materials in the roadway. Lava itself just flowing naturally isn't really flammable. It has to interact with some flammable material. Now we're looking back to the east at the eruptive vents. So there's the fissure off in the distance, the active outgassing and degassing coming out there. Uh, and then the drone's going to swing back down. We'll skip around a little bit, but there, that's just this is what I call lava therapy. So if you've had a stressful day, um, life's got you wound up in a tight knot. Sometimes, at least for me, just watching lava just passively flow across a landscape um, can really bring my blood pressure down. You can see it starting to fill in some of these depressions, so it's flowing out. Um, a lot of times, this is what you'll see here is it's moving faster back here in the channel than it is at the leading edge where it has to fan out. Uh, and it moves a little bit more slowly there. Great videography here. Obviously not me flying this drone. Now it's starting to hit and cover the road, the, the, approach, the uh, entrance road into the Blue Lagoon. This is where the flames you're seeing right here are, are from. Wow, that's just... And then there's some big solidified clots or partially solidified clots of lava that are darker, right? Like chocolate chip cookies uh, floating around in this river of lava that's advancing. So this may have been some of the most um, rapid movement of the lava that I, that I saw yesterday on video. It's filling these little channels between these flows. Um, it really takes advantage of that pre-existing topography. Um, it's following gravity. What effect does the snow have on the lava? None, essentially. Um, you might be getting a tiny bit more steam because there's snow there. Um, could be very dry snow as well, like a more granular snow. Um, is the lava cooling a lot more quickly because of the snow? Not really. Um, this lava is you know, upwards of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 1,300 degrees uh, Celsius. And so rather it's 80 degree Fahrenheit air or cold air, you know, a warm day or a cold day, snow, no snow, uh, that's pretty much inconsequential. So we'll just, it's such good footage, it's worth, um, I'm fine taking the time to watch this. I hope you are too. Uh, but you can see the main channel of orange and red lava there that's kind of going down, but the outer edges of it are starting to solidify where it's mostly black there. Roadway's really getting burned up there. That's where we're seeing a lot of the, the black ash or smoke, I guess, there. Not ash, smoke and then looking back up towards the fissures, the eruptive fissures. So this was yesterday morning. I don't know exactly what time this was taken, but this pretty close to like the peak pulse of energy from this eruption. So this thing was really uh, at its peak, more or less, I would say, pretty much from you know an hour after it started. I think it, be it began at 6 a.m. Iceland time, you know, up 
up till early afternoon it was really quite a spectacle and then things started to wind down considerably um, but this this lava flow this actual channel here did cause the problems because there's the power plant and what you can just barely I think this is correct here start to see here you can see some of the workers there let's go ahead and pause it right there and actually let's see where the drone takes us maybe it'll okay I'm gonna pause it real quick um, the power plant supplies hot water and heat of course to a huge part of the Reykjanes Peninsula and so there's a pipeline that comes right through here I believe and the lava flow unfortunately went across the pipeline and essentially uh, I don't know, severed's not the right word but um, uh, it, it compromised it and so the biggest challenge we're facing right now so this eruption while it didn't impact Grindavik and um, it didn't affect the power plant it didn't go inside the berm all the defensive measures that were in place did fine although I don't think they were really challenged this time like we saw them be challenged in the last eruption on uh, January 14th but the biggest problem was that pipeline of hot water that supplies hot water and heat to the airport area the town of Keflavik and some of the other communities north of here not not the capital area but a, a good chunk of these other communities um, we have a lot of Icelanders that still I believe are without hot water because this was their supply of hot water um, and heat for their homes was coming from the power plant so that was the, that was the biggest impact to the Icelandic people from the eruption yesterday we'll go ahead and skip through this a little bit but this is really nice footage Fisher in the background there the road uh, then the road was already taken out further to the south from the last eruption uh, there, so they're filling in the gap there so they had uh, where this road comes into the Blue Lagoon <clears throat> excuse me they have the protective berm there but once the eruption began they had to scramble with the machinery to start to to fill in that gap uh, as it turns out the lava didn't end up over here so it wasn't um, really tested as I said before uh, the lava was mainly following this this low channel here but you can see some of the workers there working on that the Blue Lagoon was evacuated. Oh, here's another gap here with another roadway. And that, oh, that's the pipeline right there. So this is the pipeline. <clears throat> There's a little road right next to the pipeline so that they can access it and make repairs if needed. And I mean, you can see how close some of the heavy equipment and the operators are to this tongue of lava, which is encroaching upon this. But you know, literally minutes after this exact image was taken, they had some of this lava actually come across the the pipeline there and that's the biggest problem that's the biggest issue that we had from that um, okay let me check Amanda's Joe has sent me a few things I'll have to come back to these maybe in a minute here Amanda Joe uh, let me get through these first so oh boy let's go back to that that looks exciting so just a close-up view of the workers there and then a view of that lava coming across the roadway the fissure in the background there looking more or less to the east um, just really nice view there of the way these flows behave cools on the sides these these form levees on the margin of the lava channel um, it can actually build up the sides and it can constrain the lava channel further the place where it tends to branch out the most is down at the leading edge sometimes though if you start bringing in more lava through the channel or if it starts to get backed up like it is to the left of the roadway here um, then sometimes the lava can break out over top the levees and start heading in other directions and so in some respects it behaves much like a river or water but in many other respects it doesn't there's a really compelling image there that that's the sign to the blue lagoon turn off there um, just, so this is the blue lagoon turn off and then just the lava straight across the road just kind of a crazy view there. there's a parking lot sign there in the smoke um, there's the lava and you can see it's, it's going down this embankment so it's speeding up a little bit as it goes down this steeper slope uh, on the road grade and then at the far right edge of the view you can see it slowing down a little bit uh, but it's carrying these chunks of partially solidified lava with it 
probably pieces that have been carried down from the vent, maybe pieces have been ripped up from the channel walls. And then along the margin here where it's really starting to slow down, this will start to solidify and build this, this wall, this levee. Very cool. This just this is the stuff that excites me, is just just watching lava in action. It's of course unfortunate that we're seeing a roadway destroyed and, and we had the pipeline issue. Um, and in some respects, and I think that's the end of the video, I think they're bringing the drone in for a landing there. So we'll go ahead and uh, skip out of that. So, but nice little video there from that, that um, news agency. This is another little video of the crews. There's the berm that they're working on filling in that gap there in the berm. And here's that same flow. This is a very short video advancing uh, across it. So just just giving you an idea of what these good men and women are doing as they're working on the defense structures for this area. Um, and they're literally like, you know, a stone's throw away from this lava flow that's continuing to advance. I mean, you're, you're trying to do your task and operate your equipment, but I'm sure you've got like one eye on that lava flow as well because um, you want to watch where that is so another view of that there and then that's I think almost the end of that little that little video but yeah mostly roadway being burned there that's where all the black material is coming from there um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me let's see so then there was a couple of other neat things that came out yesterday this is a satellite image of the eruption probably yeah it was taken at about one o'clock yesterday um, near its peak or maybe near its its mass maximum extent I think can we zoom that in a bit let's see uh, maybe I can do it with some key keyboard here um, no that's the wrong way oh here we go whoops I did it the wrong way let's zoom in as much as we can well I just did it Okay, that's probably as close as it's going to get without me futzing with it too much. Um, so this just nicely shows sort of the overall layout of things. So this is oriented with north up. The You can see the defensive wall around the power plant here and the blue lagoon right here. Um, there's uh, Thorpeorn, the hill that overlooks the power plant just to the south. Grindavik, you can just barely make out some of the... Uh, yeah, Grindavik is down here, just to give you a little bit of scale, and there's the coast. And then you can actually see also th through a little bit of a cloud here, actually it's not even the cloud, it's the gas. So you can see the gas coming out of these fissures. We had northerly or northeasterly winds yesterday, and so the volcanic gases were being carried from the eruption site to the south or southwest and right into the town area but you can make out the outline of the January 14th lava flow here uh, that's the main lava field and then there's a smaller one right here where uh, that small lava flow erupted we saw it on my live stream that fissure open up and that was the small eruption and vent that destroyed three of the houses there they did report too. Uh, the Met Office reported that with the wind pattern as it was when this volcano or this volcanic episode began yesterday um, it was vigorous enough and energetic enough at least in the beginning that it was throwing out these foamy gas rich chunks of lava that were carried by the wind and some of them actually fell down out of the sky in a uh, good and I think the si like maybe up to like fist size you know somewhere around baseball size um, but of course they're not as dense as a baseball they're very light and frothy filled with gases but they were carried a few kilometers with the winds and then settled there uh, in Grindavik which is interesting that um, so we so we did have initially excuse me a little bit more uh, vigor to the eruption um, the other cool thing we saw yesterday in my live stream if you were with me is uh, I was yapping about something maybe about halfway through and then I noticed in the live chat that there were viewers and so thank you viewers for for noticing this some of you were probably listening to me or or watching but you also had some of the webcams up and the webcams were showing at the north end 
of the Fisher system. There was very vigorous, intense plumes of gas uh, moving up into the sky. That's mu much more vigorous than what you see during the eruption. And we, I was able to switch over to those webcams and we kind of watched it. Um, and there was a very clear white plume of uh, material that was coming out of part of the, the vent. And then there was another area that was very dark. And, you know, I had to kind of scramble and think on the fly, but I knew, you know, based on the area, there's no pipelines, there's really no infrastructure. So the question was, well, what the, the white plume was obviously steam. The dark plume, I wasn't sure initially what it was because it, it looked like a lot like what you saw there when it's the lava's going across the roadway. Um, but I pretty quickly, I think, um, interpreted that behavior to be ash. And so at the at the time as we were talking there, I, I came up with the idea, and maybe some of you did too, I'm not claiming ownership on it, that we possibly had groundwater mixing with the lava just below the surface, that groundwater was coming in at such a rate that it was able to uh, basically be heated up by the lava, flash that water to steam, which is an expansive process, and had enough energy during that expansion process that it was actually fragmenting the lava into tiny particles. The gases were, or the, the steam was pushing that material out of the vent and so we actually were seeing some ash there. So there was a, what we call a hydrovolcanic eruption or the fun word for yesterday was a phreatomagmatic eruption. So it was very local, it was small, but I think we saw some of that locally explosive activity there at the north end of the vent. So that was kind of a cool highlight for me. Uh, and then recognizing kind of what we were seeing that the, the fissure system was erupting lava in most of the areas, but there was this little anomalous area to the north that for tens of minutes yesterday was interacting with the water and behaving explosively. Um, and then I, I thought out loud that, you know, probably what that's doing is actually widening out the vent because you're, you're blasting material out of the vent. You've increased the explosivity to some degree, and that's probably widening out the vent. And then on kind of a whim and just a, a cool thought that popped into my head, I whizzed you guys over on, with Google Earth to a place here in southern Idaho that basically has that exact same scenario that played out 2000, 2000 years ago. A fissure eruption where one little section of it interacted with groundwater, reamed out a wider uh, crater or hole along the fissure system, and blew out not just ash but actually blocks of rock as well. Rocks that were in the, the walls of the fissure, some of which were up to about two meters. So. Um, so that's a quick recap on what happened yesterday, and that was pretty neat. So, so there's a, a nice little satellite view of the eruption when it took place. Um, and then someone sent me this. This is kind of fun. I'll try, try to do the best I can with it. This is a 3D model. So this is the same eruption area. Um, so you can see the main fissure vents right here. Let's see, I can scoot back a little bit. So you can go far enough back that it shows. How do you move it like up on the screen? Well, that's probably good enough. So you can see the January 14th lava field down here at the bottom. Um, maybe we'll make that. Well, that's as big as it's going to go here, team. Oh, that's a little better. There we go. Um, but here's the January 14th lava field. There's the hill, Thorpeorn. There's the berm around the power plant and Blue Lagoon. And this is just another view of yesterday's eruption site. So this is probably later in the day. The fissures right there where you can see some of the gas coming out. The lava field that flowed to both the east, well really all directions, a little bit to the south, some to the east, some to the north, and then this long tongue uh, that wrapped around, um, this is Stora Stogafelt here, this hill came down this channel, little tongue went to the north, and then this bigger tongue that went to the southwest. And uh, unfortunately, right there, there's the pipeline area and took out the pipeline. So you can actually uh, move this around and kind of see it from different directions. So so um, I'll make sure I put all these in the video descriptions. And thank you for the folks that sent these and those that made these. Um, you can actually look at it from the bottom. That's kind of crazy, right? That's what that's what the volcano, the magma chamber sees as it's coming up, I guess. So pretty cool stuff. Uh, technology. Awesome. Um, OK.
So there is some of the, I guess, debriefing and, and uh, information from yesterday, yesterday's eruption. Uh, I want to start with our Met Office update. I did this time get the Met Office update in English. Uh, some folks made me aware of this. I did know that it existed, but in the past, what I've seen with the Met Office is they'll, when they first issue an update, it's always in Icelandic on the Icelandic link. And then sometimes it takes a little while for the English version to get put up. So there have been times in the past where I wanted the most up-to-date um, update and the English version wasn't available. And that's why I think I just fall into, into the habit, and I apologize for that, of using the Icelandic version with the Google Translate, and then we, we've run across these kind of wonky terminologies. But let's go through this a little bit here. So this was updated today, February 9th. So the activity diminishes further. They have quantified more or less the actual amount of lava that has erupted, about 15 million cubic meters of lava. Um, and let's see, volcanic tremor has significantly decreased. The decrease was detected shortly after noon alongside decreased eruptive activity on the fissure and activity became more confined in separate craters. So the whole fissure was erupting initially, but over time, and we've seen this before, that wanes and you just get a few little spots or little cones along that fissure that are active. Temporary increases of the volcanic tremor were noted last evening, which coincided with increased volcanic activity. During the night, the activity decreased further, and between 7 and 8 this morning, there was only two eruptive craters were active. You know, I don't know if you can't quite probably see those. I think that might be one. It's possible it's slightly active still, but because it's daytime and we don't have a closer view of it, hard to say. But it doesn't look like it's actually emitting lava uh, you know, an airborne lava shooting out lava out of the vent, at least now. So, uh, back to the update. Uh, for the fast few hours, no lava fountaining, oh, there you go, has been observed on webcams, but activity within the craters might still be ongoing. So, it's for all intents and purposes, it's definitely winded down. Not much else to, to see there. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where it's at right now. Satellite imagery. Satellite radar imagery taken around 3 o'clock yesterday shows sur surface subsidence of 10 centimeters <coughs> excuse me, in Svartsengi area, northwest of Mount Thorpeorn. So when magma flowed there from there towards Sunnakur Crater Row. So let me jump to that, and then we'll come back to the update. So here is, let's make that a little smaller, <coughs> the latest satellite imagery using radar. And this is a nice map here. There's Grindavik. Uh, the January 14th lava flows, because yesterday's eruption was nearly on top of and the fissures were very close to and parallel to the December 18th lava flows, you've got the combined December 18th flows and yesterday's February 8th flows somewhat superimposed here. The red line is the fissure system. And what this is showing in the colors here is the amount of uplift or or subsidence or downdrop in the in the surface over the last two days. So while we've been typically seeing this area above the magma sill or the magma body inflating, because when the eruption occurred, some of that magma exited, followed the conduits and pathways into the dike system and started erupting over here yesterday. That's meant that there's been an overall, at least over the last two days here, a decrease in the surface elevation. So it's actually <clears throat> dropped down a little bit as much as, uh, if you look at some of those pink colors there, as much as about 100 millimeters, about 10 centimeters, about five inches. So that's how much decrease in the land elevation there's been. So, and this is typical of earthquakes. We Before the eruption, we typically see inflation as things are rising and expanding, as that magma is becoming pressurized in the subsurface. But once it finds a conduit out to the surface and the eruption begins, then we would see a subsequent deflation. And that's, what, that's exactly what you would predict, and that's exactly what we saw. At the same time, over here by the vents, because magma was injected into this area, uh, we see there has been a bit of inflation. So over that 24 or so hour period, the land rose up to maybe 
15 centimeters, uh, about seven, eight inches, if you will, over in this area. So some nice imagery there using some of the satellite uh, data to just confirm maybe what the GPS uh, ground stations are showing us. It's always nice to get multiple lines of data that show the same thing so that you can feel really confident in your analysis. So let me go back to the update real quick here. Uh, make that a little bit bigger. Um, okay, model calculations based on these data su suggest that about 10 million cubic meters of magma has flowed from the magma reservoir right here beneath Svartsengi towards the eruption site at uh, Sunukur, Sunukur Crater Row. Um, and so that's how much magma left this area and injected into this region uh, in order to find its way to the surface. That's the plumbing system so far that this system has established. Magma storage and accumulation here and magma transport to the surface over in this region. That's the system that it is employed right now. Will it always keep using that system? Who knows? But right now, until we start seeing data that trends in a different direction, the next eruption you would expect then would follow a similar pattern until we see some other data. A um, couple other things I think are important here. Seismic activity has been reduced. Uh, about 40 earthquakes during that period. They were all less than one. Um, we already kind of read that part there. Oh, this is a, this is a good number here. Um, Volume estimates, we got that, but it corresponds to an average extrusion rate of about 600 cubic meters per second. So every second, um, it was pumping out 600 cubic meters uh, of magma, which is during that during that first seven hours when it was really active. That's that's quite a bit. That's significant. Um, and yet we'll see when we get to the end of my update, that number is not that impressive when you look at some other other numbers that might be out there. Um, although the eruption has significantly decreased, it's still too early to declare it has come to an end. Met Office is going to keep watch and they'll put out a new hazard assessment later today. So after, after my live stream is recorded, I'm sure they'll, they'll put something new out probably. Um, the other update that came out yesterday, uh, late afternoon, was, let's see if there's anything, basically they're saying that um, the, the Vigor had decreased somewhat. Uh, deformation signals had diminished, indicating that magma is no longer ascending under as much pressure as before. I'll get to that when we get to the paper at the end that I want to share with you. Um, and then they've got a nice map here. Let me show you a bigger view of this map that shows just a nice little summary map that shows uh, the extent of the lava field. So here's the power plant, Blue Lagoon. There's the defensive wall. Uh, the hill, Silingerfeld, there's Thorpjorn, uh, Storastogafeld, this hill here. Gerindevik is off the view to the south. The dark purple is the extent of the December 18th to 21st eruption. And then the lighter purple shade is what erupted yesterday. And it did in some places overlap. So these, these, these two flows, not everywhere, but in some places are now actually stacked. We actually have two flows that are you know less than two months apart in age that in some places in this flow field are actually stacked on top of each other so um oh someone says the new update is already out so, all right let's let's do this real time so let's go to let's see if they've got the english version though right sometimes oh there we go all right so this is probably the new hazard map so thanks for letting me know that was uh ann eisner thanks uh, okay, so no signs of eruptive activity. So this is hot off the press here, team. Um, February 9th, 3.30. So yeah, that would have been about an hour ago, I guess. No eruptive activity observed in a drone flight over the site. So they flew over it looking for those red incandescent glows. They didn't see anything really coming out of the ground. Uh, this suggests that the eruption is ending. Um, they've updated the hazard assessment map according to the development of the eruptive activity. Changes have been made for some hazards. Hazards due to opening of volcanic fissures has decreased. That makes sense because the eruption is coming to an end. But hazards due to gas pollution are still considered to be likely by the lava flow front. So absolutely. So anywhere you're um, around the, the edge of the lava field, it's going to take some number of days and weeks, possibly even months, 
for all those gases trapped in the lava to continue to degas. And remember that even though it's black and it looks crusted over and hard on the surface, it can still be incandescent and somewhat molten just a few uh, feet or you know centimeters down inside that lava flow. Hazards due to lava flows are still in place and lava lobes can burst out from the lava flow front. Um, hazards due to sinkholes and fault movements are still considered high in zone four. So it's their job as the um, the Met Office's job to kind of regularly update these hazard maps over time. So you can see the different hazards that exist in e each zone and they'll continue to change this and monitor this as probably with each subsequent eruption or when we get new monitoring data. And you can nicely see here, we'll zoom in a little bit there, there's the eruptive fissure. I'd like to, I, I mean, it's interesting, um, the, the initial fissure that was on the maps that I drew on my Google Earth was just this northeast-southwest line, which was almost perfectly parallel to the December 18th eruptive fissure, made perfect sense to me. Um, but I'm interested to see with this other line here, there's this elbow, this kink in the fissure system and this one kind of trends off at like a 30 degree angle, almost due south. Um, it'll be interesting to look maybe, I haven't done this yet, at older Google Earth images before this eruption and see if you can see something on the surface. Doesn't mean that you will, um, but clearly the magma found some other pathway out. Um, so it, you have this older fracture system that follows this northeast southwest trend, but clearly it found some preferential path with this other trend here. So kind of an interesting little geometry. You don't always see that. Probably not hugely significant, but just kind of interesting nonetheless. So so thanks for letting me know about the about the the updated map and the new update from the Met Office. Tremendous. Okay, let's look at um we did that. Let's look at the earthquakes. Um not much to report when it comes to seismic activity. I'll go ahead and refresh that, see if there's anything new. Um, down here in the peninsula region, there's a little swarm out here offshore, but I'm not, this is not significant. It's like six earthquakes in the last 24 hours. They're all pretty small. It's part of the plate boundary system, not a big deal. And then closer to the area we're interested in, um, yeah, there's been a few earthquakes, but they're, they're small. Um, most likely do. It looks like the the biggest cluster is right near... Oh, this is further east. I'm looking at this a little differently. Yeah, so here's where our eruption took place. So there's a little bit of activity over near the Fagardalsfjallt system that erupted from 2021 to 2023. Um, but I'm not... I think these are just related to stresses. You've just... You just pumped out a bunch of magma, you had an eruption a few kilometers away, and you're just reactivating some of these small faults that are over here. I don't think this is at all right now indicative of magma movement. These are all fairly deep. That's seven kilometers. That's eight. That's about seven. That's about eight. That's about seven. Yeah, so none of these, <clears throat> there's a deeper one, almost 12. There's one shallow one way over here that's one, but yeah. So I'm not alarmed at all by that little cluster um, right now. And similarly over by Lake uh, Klevravatn, these little clusters here, probably not a big deal. So we'll just keep an eye on the earthquakes moving forward. Let's look at the GPS data. Uh, so there's some interesting trends here as well. So if we go the one we've been watching the most uh, is the Svartsengi one. So you can see, we'll just start with the uplift one. Here's the December 18th eruption. The January 14th one is here. The magma continued to accumulate. The ground continued to rise. And then yesterday, you can see this drop right here. So then it drops. But then if you look closely, and again, we're only, you know, we're a little over 24 hours since the last eruption. So we only have three dots here. Three dots don't make a very great statistical trend, but it's all we have to go on right now. So you can see an upward trend, which suggests very weakly, but we'd want to look at more data over more time. But this is suggestive that the 
process of inflation has already begun again. You erupted the magma that was that was overpressurized, that was pushed out into this dike system to the east, and now back there under the power plant, the cycle uh, starts over again, and we start refilling and pressurizing the magma system. You can also see it, um, you can see it on a couple of these, but let's look at the the Elvorp station, same sort of same sort of data trend. So eruption, it drops, it deflates because you're ejecting, you're moving the magma from one place to another. So this station was closest to the magma chamber. So it dropped as the magma moved to the east, but then you can see at least two points. Again, very limited data, but a little bit of an upward trend there. So um, anything else in here that's, I mean, I think you're seeing a lot of the same trends at other stations. I haven't dove into this a lot since yesterday, um, but pretty similar as I look at all these other ones here. Yeah, this one here, Thorpeorn. This is the four-hour one. So this one gives us a, a more data points because it's it's relaying data, GPS data every four hours instead of eight hours. So there's the eruption drops, another little drop there, <clears throat> probably during the eruption as more magma was moving into the system. And this one, and then it, it comes back up a little bit and doesn't seem to be moving up dramatically here. Uh, it's more or less stagnant, but interesting trend. So we'll continue to monitor the GPS stations because they're a really valuable tool. Um, and I think, you know, we'll have to see, is, is this, is the pattern going to continue in terms of, let's find a good example, uh, like this one here, you can see this sort of sawtooth pattern where <clears throat> we have inflation over time, excuse me real quick, <clears throat> and then we have deflation during the December 18th eruption, inflation, deflation during the January 14th eruption, inflation, deflation for the February 18th, February 8th, excuse me, yesterday eruption. So are we just going to have to wait until these dots start trending back up? It is interesting to note that the the threshold of each eruption has slightly moved up each time. So December 18th, it's here. For January 14th, it's a little subtle, but it might be about the same or a little bit higher, but it definitely has moved up yesterday for the February 8th eighth eruption. Similarly, if you look where it deflates to, it drops further, you know, in, in terms of just overall elevation here. And then as it drops after the January 14th eruption, it's at a higher point, the elevation of the ground, than after the December 18th eruption. And similarly, when we look at yesterday's eruption, we're at a slightly higher elevation than that one. So are these little sawtooth patterns trending upwards possibly reflecting the elastic nature of the crust. Every time you have these intrusion, inflation, deflation events, you're inflating uh, the crust, you're heating it up more, and it's be behaving a little bit more elastically over time. So, um, okay, good stuff. GPS data. Now let's move. Uh, last two things I want to do before we get to your questions, and thanks again for everyone for joining me. Um, I hope Susan is hanging in there. It looks like she's tapped out on questions. She says she sent four pages to me already. Yeah, that should fill the show for sure. If you have other questions, uh, maybe you can save those for uh, next time. Or maybe see if someone, you know, there's a good chance with, holy cow, four pages of questions that someone has sent a similar question already. Let me take a quick little drink. There we go. Wet my whistle. Okay, so the last couple things I want to bring up here are some of the more human element stories. So <clears throat> these are just things reported to me, uh, mainly from Amanda Joe, uh, but also Ace 10, who I think is now off the live chat, but he'll, I'm sure, watch this later. So appreciate both of them for sending me some information, uh, especially Amanda Joe, who sends me these uh, very organized, let me pull her pull her email up because she used to send it on messenger and it was great getting that that way but now she's like typing them up and providing links so it's really awesome so probably the um the biggest thing that's happened i don't really have a lot of links here to the story so i'm just gonna um just kind of go through these quickly with you 
for our good friend Amanda Joe and others that have been displaced from their homes in Grindavik, uh, the much anticipated bill that was going to basically allow the government to buy up, buy out those who want to sell their home in Grindavik, free up that equity and cash so that they can move forward on their future. That got delayed yesterday, I guess, in Parliament. They had other issues come up, and, and whatever wherever that was on the agenda, that got bumped. And so they're hoping that gets done today. And if, uh, if she's still on the live chat, I'm sure she can add more detail there or maybe um, let me know if, if I'm getting that right. So so that's a bummer because I think Amanda Joe was hoping that the bill would pass and then the, the next steps could be uh, she could get moving on using some of that 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 cash and equity from selling her house and putting that towards her new house. Um, okay, so the biggest issue, of course, in Reykjavik right now is the breached uh, water line. And so we've got the power plant here. We saw that lava flow came come down, take out the roadway here. It more or less paralleled the road, um, but it followed this little channel here, this little low area probably between these two lava flows. And somewhere I'd say right about here is where it went over the pipeline. And that pipeline, if you follow it, heads up to the northwest. I guess I kind of lost it here. Um, and then there's other pipelines that intersect it, but basically it sends water to the International Airport, to the town of Keflavik, uh, to these other communities right here. So all of these towns in this region, uh, as best I understand, and all the way out to the tip of the peninsula, to uh, Garthur, all these communities rely on this hot water and as a, as also as a heating source. So from Ace 10, who actually lives somewhere on the peninsula, he didn't say where, but he said I could share the information he sent, so thank you to him. He tells me that for these people in, in these communities today, uh, all the outdoor uh, swimming pools are all closed. Um, they probably shut the hot water supply down to the pools. That's that's my assumption there. All the schools are closed. And he says they haven't had hot water since 9 p.m. People are using electrical heaters in their house, um, kind of like heating up the room that they need to be in. But I think they've, at, they've asked um, people not to run more than two heaters at a time in their house, because if you're using electrical heaters, then you're using a lot of electricity. Uh, and the problem is, is when the hot water supply is gone and heat becomes a problem, people start amping up their electricity demand on the system, which can quickly overwhelm the electrical grid that they run off of. And so, uh, so all these people, unfortunately, are trying to deal with, you know, staying reasonably comfortable um, acquiring those basic needs but also not overwhelming the system and conserving as much as possible. He said there were long lines at some of the stores to purchase um, some of these little space heaters but for the most part there wasn't there wasn't chaos there wasn't you know everyone was pretty orderly uh, the government brought in <clears throat> some they freed up some more electric heaters and it seems like for the most part most of the folks have them as far as I could tell from his from his email. Um, from Amanda Joe, she tells me directly, and let me pull back up on this other screen her email to me, um, that the workers worked all night last night to connect new pipes. So what they're trying to do, there's a lava flow right over the top of this. I'm try, sorry I don't have that shown on Google Earth, but what they're trying to do is just bypass it. So they're basically, you know, connecting pipes together, I guess sort of like Tinker Toy or Lego style, so they can get around the edge of this lava flow front, which has pretty much stopped moving, um, and then reconnect to this part of the pipe here. Recognizing that that part of the pipeline that's been buried in lava, you're not getting back, you're not accessing that anytime soon. Like that lava is still molten, it's very hot down there. Um, I don't know if it's melted the steel. Who knows exactly what's taking place, but that's actually compromised the whole system, and so they're they're trying to reroute. And I don't know if it's on this direction. I guess they would come out this way with the lava over here, but they're trying to basically um, connect all that here, bypassing that damaged section. Um, other news that uh, Amanda Joe uh, 
acquired and put together um, related to the airport. So flights have been unaffected. So that's good news. Iceland is still completely open for tourism and business. If you're flying into Iceland and visiting other parts of the country, I mean, we're still only talking about a very small area of this huge, beautiful country. So let's let's be very clear there. If you have travel plans to Iceland, go. It's It's awesome. There's so many great things to see, all the waterfalls and uh, other volcanic features, the glaciers, go for it. So the flights have been unaffected. The only real noticeable difference at the airport is that they that they, they don't have much heating of the space in the terminal. So it's a little chilly in the terminal. Um, so if you're flying into Iceland, you might want to. You're if you're flying into Iceland in February, <laughs> I'm assuming you've packed some cold weather clothing anyway. The difference would be maybe have some of that cold weather clothing accessible for when, for when you get off your plane in Iceland you might want to put it on as soon as you get into the the airport terminal there so last couple things from Amanda Joe I'm just gonna kinda scroll through this great email she sent me um, and maybe hit the highlights yeah she has a friend she says it's working on the the bypass of the water pipe it's very hard work it was very cold negative 14 celsius long night for all the contractors they have been needing to drain water from the pipes in order to even begin the new connections um, they're working directly beside the lava flow in some areas so that's that's got to be just a really difficult uh, environment to work in it's freezing cold outside yet you've got a lava flow right next to you which is putting out volcanic gases um, you need to fix the pipes, but you have to get the water out of the pipe so you can hook the new pipes together. Um, so that's what they're kind of dealing with there. Um, let's see. She talks about just they're accepting portable heaters from the public. So if people like in other communities want to donate or uh, lend some of these residents with portable heaters, that's very much accepted. Um, there's the grocery store nearby that has uh, they have a generator that they're using in case the power goes out so they can keep operating and and providing people with food uh, no cold water flows to the airport some of the toilets are closed uh, the army let's see yeah let's see hot water supply uh, guests of the Marriott Hotel. I think I've actually stayed in that hotel. There's a, a brand new Marriott. I think it's right there, right near the airport. Um, some of those guests had to be relocated to other Marriott locations due to lack of hot water and heating. So so they're feeling the effects there um, with this, even though this was a fairly small eruption. And for the most part, you'd think we dodged a bullet, if you will, because we didn't have any significant infrastructure impacted. Um, this pipeline is turning out to be the biggest issue. Um, and I think that was about it. Then the rest of the stuff she sent me was science stuff, which I've, I've kind of got uh, a handle on that. So thanks as all, always to Amanda Joe for sending some of that information. Okay, the final thing I have, and then we'll get to these questions here, team is a new paper came out and this is actually on if you go back to the the met office update they actually talk about it oh they do have i guess i didn't mention this but i did talk about the um the plume we saw yesterday with the the, the very vigorous plume of white and gray um, so after I on the live stream, we, we collectively as a community, we caught that and we, we figured out what it was. Um, the Met Office more or less confirming it. Um, this is likely due to magma interaction with groundwater, which results in a slightly explosive activity where white plume of steam mixes with the dark volcanic plume. So that was them uh, yesterday after the fact. But it's nice to get that confirmation because uh, that was pretty much what I thought was going on, but it's good to hear that. But the other thing that I thought they had put on here, but maybe they didn't. Uh, there's that. There's that. Oh, maybe I was mistaken. Uh, anyway, so a paper just came out yesterday with one of the Met Office scientists is the lead author of it. It was published in Science, the Journal of Science. That's one of the most prestigious journals to be um, 
if, if you can get a paper published there. It's very competitive. Uh, they don't just accept any little thing. It, of course, encompasses all of science disciplines. So getting a geology article in there is tricky. But they actually had an article where they studied the November 10th event, basically that event where the magma had been inflating beneath the power plant. And then we had that magma move quickly to the east, form a dike, along with the associated earthquake activity that rattled and shook Grindavik to the point where the whole town was evacuated uh, basically that evening. And so this is an article I'll link to where they talk about it. So this would probably be a good place to start um, if you just want to kind of get the gist of it. So this is someone um, kind of um, explaining some of their significant findings. Um, I'll come back to this in a second, this uh, diagram. So I'll put that on there. But there's also a link, if you want the good hard science, there's actually a link right here to that article. Um, and I have read through the article, but probably not uh, fully digested it. There's a section in the middle of it on some of their methods that is pretty heady, and I probably need to read it at least one more time to make sure I understand it. But in summary, I'll give you kind of the, the cutting edge parts of this, and maybe I'll even walk you through a few of the um, few of their figures here, which are pretty helpful. Let's see if I can. Oh, do we want to do it this way? We could try it this way. Yeah, that might work okay. Um, yeah, that's pretty nice. So I have a couple notes here. In summary, this new science article, which was by collaboration of scientists, including some of the Met Office scientists, what they found in analyzing the seismic data, the ground deformation data, both with GPS and with satellite data, um, feels like there was a third thing there. I think that might be it. But using the data that they had available to them, they found that the flow rate of the magma into the dike system, and remember, this did not culminate in an eruption. This was just moving magma from the storage container, the sill, and then moving it through rock and breaking rock and creating earthquakes and forming uh, a dike a uh, 15 kilometer long dike. Remember way back in November, um, if you were still, if you were with me way back then, we, I don't know if I still have it on here, do I? Maybe I don't. Um, yeah, we, <laughs> if, you, if you were watching me way back then, there were no berms, we weren't looking at eruptive vents, uh, none of that was happening. We were just looking at this big orange line, um, let me get rid of that last one there, this big orange line, 15 kilometers in length, that represented where magma had intruded to from this larger magma body right about here. Um, and so this article then, oh no, I got to find where I was, here we go. Um, I don't want that. Oh, maybe that's the way it works. Okay. So this article then talks about the, the flow rate there um, and that the dike was actually pretty large. And so th the dike that was intruded had a lot of space to fill, 15 kilometers long. I think I read somewhere that it was wide as eight meters, which is pretty remarkable. That's like 27 feet or so. And the dike itself, in terms of the flow rate, this is the big number that was pretty staggering when I saw it, and then I had to read it to kind of digest it. So the rate at which magma was flowing laterally and then upwards through the dike system, and they had to check the numbers too, because they were just as incredulous as I, I was when I, I looked at it, but they've confirmed it. And that's the great thing about science is people, you go through a peer review process, your data gets scrutinized. Um, and the data can't be really disputed. Your interpretations maybe can be disputed, but their measurements of that data was that the, the magma was moving through, being injected into the rock at a rate of 7,400 cubic meters per second. So it's volume over time. It's how much magma was flowing through the system 
every second. So the idea would be, and it's a similar number to what we use with rivers and streams. So if you've ever stood next to any river or stream and thought about how much water is passing by you, um, and it's a tricky number too because we tend to think of volumes here in America, we think of gallons. We buy our gas in gallons. We use buy gallons of milk. If you're in other parts of the world, you of course use liters as a unit of volume measure. Um, but when we talk about magmas and rivers and streams, we tend to use cubic meters. And to think about 7,400 cubic meters, I mean, I can't even, my arms don't even stretch that far to show you what one cubic meter is for the most part, um, that was moving through the system, through these rocks, every second. Uh, it's just incredible. To put it into context, I looked up what the flows of some rivers were, some of the world's big rivers, and found a river that is almost exactly has an average flow rate of 7,400 cubic meters per second. And it's the Columbia River in the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. So if you stood at the mouth of the Columbia River at Astoria, Oregon, and watched that water go into the ocean and tried to wrap your head around how much water is actually flowing um, out to sea on an average day or an average year or average part of the year, you would have about that same number, 7,400 cubic meters of water flowing into the sea, not just per day, not per hour, not even per minute, every second, right? And if you times that by 60, that would be how many minutes? If you times that by um, 60, you could figure out how many hours in an hour. You could play the math game if you want to, but it's incredible rate. It turns out it's about two to three times larger than the magma influx rate at the Fagradalsfjallt eruptions. So these eruptions here in 2021 to 2023, right by the big F there on this diagram. So the magma supply, it's not that so much that there was more magma, it's just that the magma was moving faster. So think of cubic feet per second. It's partly velocity and it's partly area that determines this rate. It's how much how much magma was moving through the rock per second. Okay, hopefully I've explained that well. I, I gave it a good shot. Um, so that meant then, and you, if you were watching the events there around November 10th, or if you were like uh, Amanda Joe and you were in Grindavik on November 10th, you know what I'm about to say. When you're pushing magma through rock at that sort of rate, the rock is breaking frequently, the rock is breaking dramatically, and you're going to get a lot of earthquakes. And that's what some of these um, these graphics show here. So let me walk you through a couple of these. And hopefully you guys find this as, uh, as fascinating as I did. I, I read this this morning. Um, it just came out yesterday. Literally, the paper was formally published on February 8th. Uh, we had a social event last night, so I didn't read it last night. But literally an hour before we got on here, I read the paper digested it as best I could so I could relay some of this to you. Um, so let's see if we can, let's see how big, why does it go smaller when I do that? Um, don't know. Oh, here we go. That should be good. All right, so here we go. So here's just an overview of everything we hopefully already know. Um, here's the good end of Vic. There's, and, and again, they're only looking at it, this, of course, doesn't take into account the eruption from yesterday, but they do look at the December 18th and the January 14th events to some degree. But the main thing that they're interested in is what happened on November 10th, because remember, that was the that was the initial event. They'd been seeing uplift back in late October. There was signs of unrest. There was some earthquake activity, but mostly small. But then the whole thing started with a bang, literally, when you think about magma rates at that speed, uh, on November 10th. Um, so let's just go straight to some of these other diagrams here. The, this is the earthquake pattern, and you can see the sizes of the earthquakes here, but mostly small earthquakes, I think mostly threes and below. There might be a couple fours in there. And this is from De October 25th to November 9th. Okay, so you can see that, that swarm of earthquakes in there. Um, and then there's where the, the dike forms here. So they're really not forming along the trend of the dike, which is interesting. Then the next little diagram here, um, C, <coughs> excuse me, shows earthquake patterns from midnight, November 10th, to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, November 10th. So this was 
literally this was the calm before the storm um, and then here's the earthquakes on November 10th from 3 o'clock in the afternoon until noon the next day <clears throat> and some of these are significant events so you can see there was uh, a 4.1 earthquake 4.8 5.2 5.3 that's what's shown in these blue different shapes in here you can see some of the size of some of these circles um, uh, you know so we had fours and fives and smaller quakes and then you can nicely see the trend of the earthquakes here um, over time. The other thing you can see with the color of the dots, I guess I didn't mention this with the other ones, but I think it's mostly um, notable here, is that if it's happening November 10th around 3 o'clock, it's red. And as we go later into that evening, they become yellow, orange, yellow, green, and then blue. And look at the trend there. Mostly all the red earthquakes initially, for the most part, are pretty close to here, the more or less the, the northern two-thirds of the dike system. But then those earthquakes propagate down the south to the southwest. So you get now you're picking up oranges, now you're picking up yellows. Now it's right under the town, right? This is when on November 10th, which I'm sure is a it really is a historic day, um, not just for geologists, but for people from Grindavik. Um, you can see these earthquakes extended not just down to the town, but then they went into the offshore region, out into the ocean with the greens and the blues there. Then you can see a similar pattern, not quite as strong here, where the reds uh, turn into oranges. So there was some migration of quakes to the north uh, as well. But remember, this is only a, not even a 24 hour period. This is a 21 hour period of earthquake activity. So literally, I mean, we talk about earthquake swarms, there's like, a textbook example of earthquake swarms all related to this dike uh, propagating through the ground. Let's see if we can digest this figure here. Um, so this is a plot of earthquakes with latitude and time. So here's going back to October 26 here at the bottom. Let me move it up so you can see it better. Um, and and this is latitude. So obviously, if, if they're right in here, like the, the 63.9 degrees, that would be right about here. So that's basically that location would be just north of Svartsengi in the Blue Lagoon. OK, so you, hopefully you're with me here. Um, so earthquakes, you know, kind of clustered around the Blue Lagoon, power plant area, maybe a little bit further south towards like Thorpeorn. Um, but where it really where it really becomes interesting here is right here. So this is midnight November 10th I believe here's the lull right here's this like calm before the storm and these just a few earthquakes in blue and then the red notice this makes almost like a like a parabola right like a, a an arc so here's the earthquakes coming in quickly on November 10th the dike is forming and it's propagating it's moving north it's moving to the north there it is moving to the north and it's moving to the south over time and so it's lengthening over time. So this is like, this is the shotgun being fired, literally, when you think about this 7,500 cubic meters per second that the magma is just blasting through the rock. And I've never, I haven't looked at these numbers before, but this just blew my mind that you can move. I'm okay with water moving that quickly across the surface. Rivers flow at that kind of discharge rate, no problem. But to think that magma could have a flow rate that high like literally just my mind exploded and there's pieces of it all over my office now so i got some cleaning up to do um but this is just tremendous what what a tremendous study this is why this is how you get your article in science i think is not only did do you have you've done great science but you have really profound impactful results that can be applied elsewhere. So in the paper, they talk a lot about, um, let me get out of this thing. Oh boy, I'm like so zoomed in. There we go, that's a little bit more palatable. Um, but th th this, some of their, they're just recognizing something that hasn't been recognized before in terms of magma influx rates and that this could be applied elsewhere. Like you could look at Eastern African volcanoes um, and other places. So let me see if I can find um, yeah, I don't want to go through all of these because I know we have questions still, but this is some of the GPS data and shows how it moves over time. 
it's a good paper. It's worth spending time. This diagram here, um, but I thought it might be helpful, you know, and all of you, you know, don't, don't give yourself credit team. You're smart enough to read and digest this. There might be some fancy terms you have to look up, but I think all of you know enough geology to wrap your head around this and understand some of the big themes and trends here. And I, and I, you know, I've been educated in geology and doing this all my life and I still read it and there were parts where I'm like huh not sure that paragraph like made sense to me I couldn't digest it all um, but I got some of the big takeaways this shows here with the blue line so this is how much this is for the Svartsingi power plant GPS station the GPS station we have tracked the most uh, on these updates uh, and this shows the movement in blue, it shows just how much it moved cumulatively, the displacement. So here we are November 10th, and then right around 6 p.m. in the evening, I guess just before then, is when the big movement happens. So that's the fault movement, that's the, the rocks breaking as the dike is pushing through uh, and, and, and offsetting the rocks. So you can really see that jump there. And then the red line with the little triangles is how much it was moving per hour, how many centimeters of movement per hour. So here's the GPS station kind of do to do to do up and down, eh, not really doing much and then boom and then it just takes off uh, quickly. Interestingly there's not, there's uh, they're pretty well correlated um, but not perfectly. The GPS recovers quickly and deflates because you've just injected magma from the Svartsingi power plant <clears throat> away from it. So that's why you're seeing the deflation happen so quickly. So there's rapid inflation as the system becomes overpressurized and then deflation as that magma moves away and into uh, the dike that was forming. So the magma body found new space for itself off to the east through found the pre-existing fractures and cracks in the rock. Um, why didn't it erupt right above right above it in the power plant? That's what a lot of people have asked. All we can say is it found an easier path. Maybe the rocks above it and below the power plant are very rigid, maybe they're more dense, maybe they lack fractures, and there was an easier pathway of migration for the magma to move away from the power plant area. It moved to the east and then it also moved up and we think it got as close as within a uh, half a kilometer of the surface. Lots more good data there, but let's just go straight to the last thing they show, um, which is this figure here, which I think a lot of you will uh, find very helpful. So um, I think I have it. No, this is probably good here. So here's a nice, um, you've seen my silly drawings in here. And then we had some really nice 3D drawings from uh, a gentleman in the UK. I can't remember his name right now, so I apologize. But this is the figure they put together. And the nice thing about these science journal articles is you've got graphs and data and, and to the casual observer, it can be kind of overwhelming. But a good science paper will include or try to include a diagram or a figure like this that kind of shows the whole model, shows the whole system graphically, because this is a good way that our brains work. The, the paper tells you everything this graphic shows, but it does it with words and in sentences and paragraphs that go on and on for pages. But this nicely summarizes it. So uh, what we can see here is the plate um, the plate spreading, right? So you can see the big pink arrows here showing the plate spreading. We can see some things at the surface, some topographic features we're familiar with. Stora Stogafelt, Sirengerfelt, Thorpeorn, these three hills. There's the blue power plant in Blue Lagoon. Here's this older crater system off to the west, Elvert. Um, then the graben that formed is in the black kind of little hashed lines here. So that's the first graben that formed, not the one that formed later. Uh, in January that went right through town. Um, the orientation of the or the projection of the dike. So everything on the surface here should look pretty familiar to you. Um, and then they've done a nice job of looking at the into the subsurface at the dike. So if you've kind of wondered what do these dikes look like, this is a pretty good representation of it. Here's Here's the magma body, these sills, and, and maybe there's more than one because we know there's been repeated intrusions into this area. Um, so here's, and they're calling it a magma domain. If you read the paper, they talk about there's actually liquid molten rock there. There's partially crystallized mush, maybe some very hot rock that's somewhat elastic, and it's a mixture of all those uh, different 
you know, think about magma on a spectrum and it in includes all of those things. So that's where the magma is coming from. Um, but then it gets overpressurized. Uh, so it inflates and inflates and inflates. And then it's like a balloon ready to pop. And when it finally gets to the point of being overpressurized, it takes off and shoots through these fractures and forms this dike. And it's not unlike, and I think I saw this somewhere yesterday. I don't know where, what, if I was on uh, a thread or something. Like somewhat like maybe like a geyser where that hot water is continuing to get hot. It becomes overpressurized. Then the gases uh, flash to steam and that drives the eruption upwards. And so it's probably not the worst analogy to think about. But you can see the dike moving off to the north here. So dike propagation along weaknesses in the crust, which we don't have mapped. We don't know exactly where those are. But the reason that the dike went northeast, southwest is that's the trend of those ancient uh, volcanic systems. So anyway, I could go on and on about this paper, um, but hopefully that was helpful. A really good, a really good paper. Uh, it does get a little meaty and heady in the middle. There's some equations, there's some physics, but I think if you start with, let me see my paper here, which has all sorts of lines drawn on it. If you start with the abstract at the beginning, run through the first, <clears throat> the first section, which is like five paragraphs, um, I think you'll be fine there. And then the next section is their, their observations about ground deformation and seismicity and how they interpreted it. That wasn't too meaty for the most part. It's when they got to the, the, the modeling um, that that becomes a little bit more, at least for me, some of you might understand it fine. Uh, that's part I need to probably go over again. And then at the end are implications. But it's a short read. The nice thing about science journal articles is they're not very lengthy. So this is literally one, two, three, four and a half pages of reading. And then there's, of course, all these great figures that I've shown you here uh, as well, which help a little bit. So um, anyway, uh, oh, this is pretty cool here. Last thing real quick here. This, this graph here shows the volume of magma and how Svartsenghi deflated basically and how the dike inflated. So the magma, you know, it came from this common point source, but it moved out of the, the sill, if you will, and filled the dike uh, quickly on November 10th. So, holy cow, that's, uh, I'm pinging right now. It's like the hairs on the back of my neck are standing up because that was it was really fun to uh, break that down with you. And by, you know, this is the great part about, this is what I love about teaching too, is by explaining it to someone else, it reinforces and helps your learning as well. So, okay, enough with that. Let me get to your questions. Um, so let me find, oh, so there were some questions that were sent before we even started, apparently. So if there's really like four pages of these, oh boy, uh, how long do we want to go? We've been going an hour and 20. Let's just, let's just try to hit these hard and rapid fire style and um, we'll see what I can do here. There's very likely to be questions I just, I can't answer. So um, Grindavik registered, okay, no longer listless. I noticed Grindavik registered earthquakes before the eruption. Registered earthquakes before eruption switched to many. Fagradalsfjall registered earthquakes after this. Elgo started at 6:30 and after reason. I think it's just tectonic stresses being tr transferred. You've got you got this overpressurized magma system under the power plant. The mo the pressure is greatest and the stress is greatest near there, but these other areas are close enough that they're feeling some of the stresses and it's causing rocks along those fractures and faults that are already pre-existing to fail and produce these small earthquakes. That's my quick answer there. From Susie Jones, uh, good morning from a wet and miserable UK. Sorry about that. Uh, just check the earthquakes and it looks like the magma is moving to the next system to the east. What are your thoughts? Same thing. Um, I, I, I don't think, I don't agree that with the interpretation right now that the magma is moving to the next system to the east. I don't think there's anything right now in the seismic data, and I think I went over this, that suggests that. Um, I need to see, I personally need to see GPS data and other seismic trends before I would be 
comfortable saying as a scientist that the magma indeed has moved into that next system. I know that the newspapers are picking up a lot on that in the media. Anytime we get an earthquake anywhere else within 100 or more kilometers of this area of Iceland, that's what everyone's thinking is, oh, now we got another volcano about to erupt. Um, I'm not seeing that just yet. Not saying it can't happen, just not seeing it. Uh, from Louisa K. Um, when the December January lava was analyzed, it showed slight change indicating long time sitting in the crust. Is this the time between December and January eruptions or much longer periods? Um, yeah, and I realize you guys in the live chat are trying to get a question in and you have like a, what, 200 character limit. Um, so, yeah, so I think, I think if I understand your question that it's true that the when they analyzed the lava it showed like you can figure out the residence time how long did this magma stay in the subsurface at a shallow level before it actually made it to eruption um, and that some of that stuff had been down there longer so is the is this the time between December and January eruptions or much longer periods uh, I guess I don't totally understand the question Louisa so I apologize um, maybe send me a clarifying one sometime Susie Jones, um, oh, we already did that one. Rock Tapper Robin, I'd like to second, oh, he wants to ask the same question and ask if any geochemical analysis of the new lava has been done yet. I haven't, I think, yes, they did sample it. So they were on the ground, boots on the ground yesterday. I saw a video or picture of them sampling the lava. I have not as of yet, and I'm not plugged into all the, all the outlets there, but I've not seen any geochemical report from that analysis. But last time I think it came out within a day or two, so we should see that very soon. Also, can you comment on the earthquake storms offshore southwest of Grindavik and along the same alignment? Um, the ones offshore are a little trickier because we don't have the GPS data. So all we can really go off there for the most part is seismic data. When we have earthquake swarms on land, we have GPS stations to show us what the what the ground is doing. The offshore systems, for the most part, I'm going to assume that they're earthquake driven and not volcanically driven. But even if they are volcanically driven, and even if volcanoes, if lava is erupting in these offshore regions southwest of the peninsula, um, it's under very deep water. Uh, I'm in feet here, but you could do it in meters too. A couple hundred, 700 feet of water. If you go further out in the system, uh, I'm presuming presuming it gets deeper. Yeah, I'm like 2,000 feet. Um, yeah, so several hundred meters of water. It's not going to manifest itself as anything, probably, um, that is even noteworthy. Could we get a Surtsey type eruption? Yeah, we could. Um, and could, depending on the wind patterns, maybe a little bit of ash blow inland, possibly, if it's something close to shore. Uh, but right now, I think tectonic movement um, of those earthquakes is probably what I would think about there. Okay. Um, okay, so that's the first page. Now I go to the second email from Susan. Oh, boy. Good stuff, team. I like that you're asking questions. I just hope that A, I'm answering them well, and B, uh, I'm giving you enough of an answer that it's satisfying. And if I'm not, I apologize. So, uh, and realize that you know you're asking one geologist. So, grain of salt. Um, from Sharon, obviously not a volcanologist, but wondering if these frequent month by month, month or several weeks apart eruptions release pressure and thus keep a giant monster eruption from happening. Wondering if this pattern of fall of frequent small eruptions have been seen elsewhere. And if it's kind of a thing in volcanology. Yeah, you see this pattern, I mean, at Kilauea, there's uh, all sorts of patterns of inflation, eruption, deflation, inflation, eruption, deflation. Um, but everything shifts a little bit over time. Like the location, we saw that if you watch some of the Kilauea updates I did, the location of the magma can change. I, I don't think, I'm not ready to say after three eruptions that we can start setting our clock on this thing. I'm not ready to say, oh, you know, there's it's about 26 days between eruptions. The last one was on February 8th. Do the math. We're going to get another one in early March. We might. Um, you're making a lot of assumptions if you project that. You're assuming that the 
influx of magma supply into the system is constant, which studies have shown it's often not. You're assuming that the space that the magma can intrude doesn't change and stays the same. Basically, the capacity of the balloon doesn't change. That's not the case. We know that the balloon has gotten bigger as the crust has become more elastic. We know that we've created more space for the magma to reside when, we, when that November 10th dike was created. Um, there's just a lot of variables there. So, but I think your overall, I mean, in a very ge general way, yeah, like if we, the other thing to think about too is this is not the kind of system erupting low viscosity, silica poor, basaltic lava. This isn't the kind of system that traps gases for decades and a hundred years in, in the magma and then finally culminates in a huge Mount St. Helens or bigger style eruption. This is not that kind of system. This is the type of system like we have in Hawaii um, that erupts low viscosity lava. Um, it erupts frequently. It doesn't trap the gas as well because the lava is so runny and low viscosity. And so um, I don't think it would be a giant monster eruption. Um, you know, even if you could somehow bottle this thing and have the last three eruption be one eruption, yeah, you'd have more lava and it would cover more ground. But for me, a giant monster eruption means explosive and more impactful. And that's not something we would see. Uh, narrow road, these intermittent eruptions are nothing I have ever seen or heard of. How prevalent is this behavior? I think I kind of covered that a little bit there, but yeah, great question. Mystic Bunny Lady, please re repost the layer graphic from the Svart Singy Well Borehole Studies. Um, oh, the little cross section there. I think, didn't I put that in the uh, in the video description? from th that episode. I think I did. Um, if you want to email me though, I can try to, I can send that paper to you with that. So if you email me at seanwilsey at gmail.com, I'll send that to you. Carol, where did the lava flow stop? Did it breach the wall? Um, I think I showed that with some of the graphics there. Um, so that question probably came early. The lava flow never really tested the berm or the barrier there, so it did not breach the wall. So um, was it successful? inconclusive because you really didn't have the lava and the wall interacting much yesterday. Uh, I.R. Brower, what is the difference between the recent three eruptions and the three more to the east starting in 2021? Those lasted much longer. Yes, and from the new paper, um, probably best just to read this, I suppose. So that's a great observation. So the three eruptions that we had in um, at Fagradalsfjall. So these three eruptions, let's just add all the good stuff. Let's take away that and these three eruptions. Okay, so we're focusing here, but uh, the last couple years, this is where the eruptions took place. And this person's absolutely correct that these eruptions lasted a lot longer. They lasted months, they lasted at least weeks. These two lasted, I think, anywhere from two or three to four weeks. This one was, this was the first one and this one lasted six months. So why are these ones more long lived and these ones are much shorter? The December one was four days, if you wanna count the whole thing. The January one was probably three days and this one, shoot, but we might be calling this one dead already on day two. Um, from the paper we talked about today, this is right before the implication section. Let me read this and then maybe help explain it. The short-lived nature of the eruptions, talking about these here, and rapid decline of pressure in the feeding source during them suggests limited overpressure in the feeding magma domain and rapid draining of magma from it, similar to the November diking. So they're explaining it by, you overpressurize the system um, and then, but you can't, you can only overpressurize it so much, right? So it, it reaches capacity, it's overpressurized a little bit, but that's enough to send the, the magma through the system to the surface and it's moving through the system quickly. So you're erupting, so your amount of overpressurized eruptible magma is limited. You're sending it through the system quickly you're erupting it quickly, and we saw that with yesterday and the December eruption that they started out very robust, uh, and then they, 
decrease significantly. So, so there's something in the behavior there in the plumbing system. It's mainly a plumbing problem or an issue, I think, here versus over here. So great question, and hopefully uh, that shed some light on it. From Keith Dowsett, where cracks open or reopen away from a fissure vent, as in Grindavik, would these close up again over time? Uh, if so, how long would that typically take? Years, decades? Uh, the short answer is no. So once this, the, the crack doesn't close, but the crack can be filled. So I showed yesterday when I took you to Idaho and Kings Bowl, I showed you a picture uh, and it's a beautiful site. You can actually see, and it's only like, it's maybe a meter wide, not even that. It's like, it's like half a meter wide, something like this. You can actually see in the rock where you can see the flow lines, the fabric, the orientation of the, the rock where the lava came out, up through the dike, and then out to the surface. Um, and I had a cool picture of that from yesterday. So the fissures, sometimes they're left open because the magma has drained out or, in, or sometimes the fissure can be, so it can be sometimes left open. It can sometimes be filled as the magma in it cools at the waning stages of the eruption, but the fissure never opens and then closes like that. So Joanne, Joanne made me a great hat. Thanks, Joanne. I love it. It hasn't been cold enough to wear yet, but if it gets colder, I'll definitely wear it. Yesterday, we saw what was likely an interaction between groundwater and erupting lava. Yes, we did. Would that be the same groundwater that feeds the power plant? Any expected impact on the power plant? Uh, that's a really good question. I, I would say based on what we saw, I wonder if someone will, someone will dive in and be able to do some research there. It'd be interesting to see how deep the groundwater was interacting with the magma. Based on what I saw yesterday, if I had to just throw a number out there, I would say that the groundwater was pretty shallow. Um, but the supply of water to lava, the ratios of those two, was pretty low. And if you think about when we saw that, it had already kind of waned a little bit. Um, it's when you get a lot of both that you can create very explosive craters, like a mar or a tuff cone. Um, the groundwater that we saw interacting with the lava was off to the east near the eruption site. The power plant is tapping groundwater, shallow groundwater that's very hot, um, which makes sense because it's sitting right over a five kilometer deep magma sill. Um, so I don't expect that there is, is any impact on the power plant yet. Now we did talk about with the boreholes that some of the borehole gauges can detect pressure and temperature changes. Um, we talked about that right before the eruption happened um, whenever I did my last show. I can't remember what day it was, maybe Monday um, on the 5th. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if anything comes out. Did, did they detect anything in the boreholes prior to yesterday's eruption? I don't know. Um, that would be interesting to see. So, so I don't think there'll be much of an impact there. From Jeff, how big is the magma chamber under the peninsula? Is it one big chamber or are there multiple that can erupt independently of each other? Right now, the understanding I have is that there's a, a deeper magma source, deeper being like 15, 20 kilometers down, something like that, um, that is feeding into the sill that sits below the power plant that's about five kilometers down. Um, there's probably also over near Fagradalsfjot to the east, a, another magma body. I don't know if it's fully still magma or if it's mostly partially crystallized into kind of mush. Um, so this is kind of the big question is where are these magma bodies underneath the entire peninsula? How many are there? Are they connected? Um, we can tell if they're connected when they erupt because we can look at the chemistries and we can see small enough changes to know if those are uh, independent or if they're they are fed by a common source so the, the the bigger conduit is maybe providing multiple pathways to multiple chambers um, good question I, I don't have a full understanding of that yet uh, gooser 3000 is it more common for lava to come from a cone or a crack in the ground like this is a crack in the ground called a volcano absolutely anytime we get any lava or ash coming out of a 
any place in the ground, it's a volcano. If it's coming out of a crack, we call those fissure eruptions. That's what we saw yesterday. Uh, if it's coming out of a centralized area, um, we might call that some other type of volcanic cone. It could be a big stratovolcano. It could be a little spatter cone. With the eruption yesterday, it started as a fissure eruption, but as the lava supply waned, we saw just a few isolated central points in the system. And so that, that's an example of a little bit of both. Uh, from Arthur, before GPS, was there a system for measuring land movement and uplift? Um, yeah, what did they use? I don't know. <laughs> um, probably just surveying. I bet there was some fancier engineering terms. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. A tilt meters might have been around for a while. So maybe the tilt meters, which is like a huge, highly sensitive carpenter's level. I don't mean huge, like the, the instrument is huge, but it measures tilt over a, a bigger area. But certainly satellite technology uh, has just totally um, increased our ability to detect a lot of movement. So I don't know much about like the history of monitoring instruments. Uh, another one from Gooser, is it more common for lava to come? Oh, that's the same question. Okay, we got that one. Tamara, is that what the baby berm was about with that incredibly brave man building to the last moment? Um, yeah, I think so. They were just trying to get as much material up in front of the lava as quickly as they could. So, yeah. Add to the question list, please. Bjorn, um, can Sean explain the viscosity of the lava and if it, and if it are pulses from the Earth's core. Um, well, there's different ideas about where some of these hotspot magmas come from. The Earth's outer core is one uh, area where we think it's generated. We also think some is generated above it in the Earth's mantle. Uh, the easiest way to explain viscosity that I like to use with my classes is thinking about something like honey. So when you have honey that's very cool like if you take it camping with you or something you know it gets it's it's very sluggish it's uh, partially solidified it doesn't flow very well same thing with lava when it, it the cooler it is the less fluid it is and then if you heat up the honey of course in a microwave or a pot of water then you can break down the crystals that have formed in that honey um, separate them and allow it to flow more smoothly and lava of course behaves much the same way. With lavas, the viscosity is usually dictated somewhat by how much of a compound called silica there is. And you can think of silica right now, which would be the, probably the simplest way to think of it, as crystals, right? So the more silica is in the magma, the more crystalline it is, the lower the temperature and the higher the viscosity, which means it's not going to flow very well. If it doesn't flow very well, it's going to trap gases, right? Imagine, take a little coffee stir straw, put it into a container of honey, and try to blow bubbles. It's hard to do. Like, you are you know, you might pass out trying to blow those bubbles. Now take a straw and put it into a glass of water and blow bubbles. Easy, right? One is a highly viscous material that allows gases to, or excuse me, one is a highly viscous material that doesn't allow gases to move through it easily, so it builds gas pressure. And another one is a highly low viscosity material that allows gases to travel through it much much more quickly. Um, okay, there's that one. I'm trying to get through these quickly. I don't feel like I'm doing a good job. Um, oh boy, email and email. Okay, round one from Susan. This email is just called more. Um, do you think, Gail, do you think if they raise the pipeline it could survive any lava flow going underneath? Is there any earth materials on earth that is lava proof? Um, yeah, I, I don't know what the solution is there. Obviously, if you had like an elevated pipeline, um, I suppose if, yeah, you could, This th that would actually work. If you had it, let's say, first of all, you need to know how high is high enough. So let's say it's 10 meters off the ground on these like pillars made out of, I don't know, the most temperature resistant steel we could. That would probably work because what'll happen is the lava will flow. It'll wrap around those support pillars. The lava against the pillars will cool very quickly because it's in contact with a much colder substance. And that chilled lava against that support pillar 
will insulate the rest of the lava and its heat from it. Um, and so this happens with trees all the time. Anytime lava has wrapped around a tree, the tree burns because it's wood, um, but you're left with these cylinders in the rock and these are called um, tree molds. And so you could, but obviously raising the pipeline, I mean, how long would that take, right? I mean, the pipeline to the airports may be five, six, seven kilometers long. You'd have to raise the pipeline up. Now you probably would need, I don't know if it gravity flows or it has pumps that pumps the water, uh, but theoretically it's possible. Um, you know, who knows? Joanne, this is Aa Lava, right? Not Pohoi Hui, it looks quite rubbly. I'm assuming she's talking about the video I showed. Um, there's a transition type between Pohoi Hui and Aa called Shelly Pohoi Hui. So the Pohoi Hui, which is the runny lava, has sort of crusted over. Um, and then it can transition into ah uh, uh. I think too, you have to think of when lava's flowing, you have the channel, which is the faster moving, more fluid lava. That could be pohoi hoi, but then on the sides and the margin where it's moving more sluggishly and slowing down, it can look much more rubbly and more like ah uh, ah. Uh. So you can have them both occurring a bit together. From Bob, I'm curious that if they so choose, when could they move the lava off of the road or water lines? I know that it stays hot for a long time. But how long is long? Um, I don't know how long until they were able to do that in Hawaii with the 2018 eruption. Um, just some ballpark ideas. I would guess, I mean, the 2021 lava field over at Fagodelsfield is still hot. The snow doesn't stay on it. And it's definitely hotter in the subsurface. And that's that lava is almost three years old at this point. Um, so years, potentially, depending on how thick the lava is, um, it could be years, potentially. Gale, theoretically, if the ground is not too frozen, <clears throat> could a bulldozer carve a channel away from the defensive wall for the lava to follow? You could. You could basically design your own path, your topographic path, um, but it doesn't always work that way. What if you have a path here, like you, a channel you've dug? What if the lava erupts here or wraps around a hill comes at it from a very high angle, pours into your channel, it'll start to spread laterally, but it'll also ramp up to the top of your channel and it could spill out that direction too. So it's not, you're tearing up the ground at a very high cost and it's not guaranteed. Uh, for Marin, are these past few years of regional lava flows considered a single long-term eruptive event? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, right now we're looking at all these events separately. We had the, the, the December event and the January eruption and yesterday's February eruption. But 10, 20 years from now, are we going to look back and be like, oh, the 2023 to whatever eruption period. And it was just punctuated eruptive events. Um, so I don't know. Um, right now, because they're in a common area and so they're they're constrained spatially and temporally or time-wise they're collectively considered a a single episode i suppose with several sort of chapters in that book that's maybe a good way to put it grandma j i saw this latest lava flow over some of the lava from december eruption can the older lava become molten again or does it remain as cinders nope so if you have the december flows here comes the February flows from yesterday right over the top. Remember, lava in contact with relatively cooler rock in this case. Um, it's not going to reactivate it at all. So, yeah, that you're not going to re-melt that material. Uh, could we get this ash if a fissure forms through Godendavik into the sea? Absolutely. So if we have a submarine under the water eruption in near Godendavik or anywhere, um, if it's in shallow water, especially shallow being, I don't know, a um, couple hundred feet or meters, I suppose, then you could have an explosive event, not a lot of water pressure on top of it. If the expanding water in the steam, kind of like a geyser, is able to overcome the water columns pressure on top of it, it will become explosive and uh, be and produce ash. Um, from Alex, lateritic soil. Oh boy, we extracted bauxite in Costa Rica near Irazu. Does Iceland use this magma berm, etc., for commercial purposes? It was detrimental to the Costa Rican surface life. Um, I don't know soils really well. Bauxite's an aluminum ore, so it's an aluminum rich soil um, for commercial purposes. I don't think so. 
Yeah, I don't really totally get the question there, so sorry I can't help there. Melanie, the caldera I was talking about was called Gackle and Gackle Ridge. I had a brain burp yesterday, couldn't remember the name. Yeah, and I think someone mentioned that in a comment somewhere, but I haven't <clears throat> dove into it. I don't know anything about that area further to the north, <clears throat> so I, I can't speak to it. Sorry. Victoria, is it possible? Drink of water. Is it possible that after each eruption, the size of the magma chamber dike increases in size and has more volume for the next eruption? I think a little bit. I think the thermal, by heating up the crust and creating more elasticity, at least in my mind, that makes sense. And we've seen that, right? The, the elevations have increased with each subsequent eruptive event. And so I think you can um, increase the size of the magma chamber a little bit but I don't know if it's hugely significant like if it if it's you know a centimeter higher one eruption versus the next even over that area is it really that significant good question Gail is it normal for this type of volcano to start and stop so quickly I think we kind of talked about that with the paper uh, we it seems like it's a, a consequence of the the plumbing supply to some degree so um, do we still have people here because from my viewpoint, it's just like I'm sitting in an office for pushing two hours now talking to my computer. But it looks like there's people here, so that's good. All right. Uh, Susan's third installment of questions. And I really do appreciate the questions. This is great. Uh, Fell to Emerson, what about the increased quakes to the east? Is the magma moving? I think I addressed that. I don't, I don't think so. I, don't, I, I need to see other supportive data to suggest that it's magma migration versus stress changes from all this craziness going on and just releasing those stresses along small fractures and faults. Lee Tube, wouldn't it be easier for lava to push the barrier on the road due to the smooth surface of the road, like what happened in the road in the January 14th eruption? Shouldn't you fracture the road first? Um, I'm not an expert on that, but I, I, I swear I read something about that. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I can't really speak to that, but I think you're onto something there. So good thought. Uh, a, B, are experts looking for weak spots in the topography or historic fissures that could become active fissures later during this event? Is that a thing? To some degree, the topography and the fractures help a little bit because we, we, we can assume that those project downward to some degree, but we're also looking at a magma body that's five kilometers down, and it, it's absolutely, I would say silly, but it's unlikely that there's fractures that go from there to the surface. Like, even though we're seeing like, you know, with the sill, the magma moves over and it comes up the dike and the, and the little diagrams I've drawn, it's equally possible that it comes up through a fracture, moves through another little sill, comes up and maybe zigzags and takes a little more circuitous, circuitous route to get to the surface. Um, from Tamara Cartwright, how do the buildings cope with this rapid rise and fall? Uh, if you're talking about the GPS measurements, remember it's very small. We're only looking at a few centimeters and it's mostly vertical motion. So to my knowledge, it's Fart Sengi and the Blue Lagoon. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very gradual rise, gradual rise. So it's not like a, a couple of centimeters of movement in a day. It's moving like less than a millimeter or maybe a millimeter or two up every eight hours, 14 hours, whatever. Uh, so it's very gradual. So I don't think it's causing any structural problems with the buildings. Rhonda, how thick was the lava from the December eruption where this eruption happened? Uh, it varied a little bit, Rhonda. I do remember we looked at a map of that. That was mapped out and near the vents, it was upwards of maybe eight to 10 meters thick, that lava from the December eruption. That's probably a good ballpark number. Charlotte Rose, any thoughts on the short fissure that is offset to yesterday's main fissure, the one that kinks to the south? Um, I don't know. I need to look into that. It's a weird geometry. I talked about it a little bit. Um, it's clearly f it found some other pathway, some north-south system. If you remember a few updates ago, there was a map that was published that showed, I, I talked about a paper where they mapped out all the fractures on the ground. Um, Simon, uh, what's his name? He's from University of Idaho. Catterhorn, I think, was one of the authors on that. And there is a set of fractures and faults on the peninsula that do run north-south. So the magma found one of those such oriented fracture systems um, when it erupted yesterday. 
Rock Tapper Robin, have they done any geochemical analysis on new lava yet? Nope, not yet. Um, not that I've seen. I, I would expect it to come out maybe today, over the weekend, Monday. Shauna, if you were to bore a hole through the stack lava layers from the two eruptions, would there be a difference between the two extracts? Um, in terms of the rock type, no. Like if I gave you a sample of each one, you wouldn't be able to tell a difference between the two. Um, but the geochemistry might be a little bit different. Uh, so that might be the only thing. Um, Amanda Joe just gave me a couple updates on the, so it looks like they agreed to the buyout. She sent me a link. I don't know if I want to take time to open that. It's not published into law yet. It'll go through parliament next week to be passed. So if that's, if I'm reading that right, that's good news that the bill, uh, the bill was pushed through and yeah, or maybe that, maybe she means it was just delayed. I don't know. So, um, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, Connie's Little Corner, does a stacking of lava flows impact the possibility of another eruption in that area and or affect the cooling process? Um, probably, well, probably not. If you stack lava flows, we're still talking about a, a very minor thickness of lava. Stacking the lava flows is still putting more weight on the crust, but um, as we've seen, I mean, this one came up under the, the, the December eruption for the most part, so it's it's probably not affecting the location of the next eruption. I think I think they are they variables. Yes, are they significant significant variables? I would say no. Carol Tennant, why does the lava not come up through the older fissures? Does the old lava effectively plug the fissure? Depends. Some as we've looked at, some fissures or fractures can be filled depending on how its last waning stages of its eruption progress. Others can be open. Uh, we saw with both the December and yesterday's eruption that they came up very close to, not exactly on, but very close to and parallel to uh, the ancient Sinukur crater system there. Um, let's see, MTP 2020. I, I took a look at some data and the trend so far seems to be each eruption is starting after the ground has inflated more. Could that excess they become more highly pressurized and explosive? Not necessarily. I just think you have a little bit more space. And so your elevation of in, of inflation to that trigger point rises a little bit. And we kind of saw that in the little sawtooth diagrams. Okay, the marathon party session is almost done. I think I've only got one more. Oh, maybe I got through them all. Did I get through them all? Um one, two, three. Oh, sweet. I think I did four. So, Susan, did I get through all of the, all four emails? I think I did. I'm a little parched, but it was good stuff. So, I think I got through all of the questions. Let me quickly scroll through. I can give you some different eye candy to look at. I don't know what you guys want to look at other than that. Um... Let me scroll through. Amanda Joe sent me a bunch of stuff. A um, bunch of articles. Cold nights. At least two more cold nights on the peninsula. So they're probably... I'm just reading her kind of headlines. So it sounds like a couple more un un uncomfortable nights of cold until they can maybe get this bypass water hot water system connected. Let me open this up somewhere other than my phone which would make more sense. Okay, Amanda Jo, I'm looking at your messages now. Um, I don't know if I want to open up all of these articles, but I just want to read your little... Difficult to say how much magma is in the chamber. She sent me an article on that. Two more nights of cold. Um, she says... All right, I'm going to try to open this one. She says, scroll down to... Oh, there's a there's a video here uh, I think with the road damage let's see if we can it says scroll to 1301 let's see if this works sorry if this is uh, the, the show's gone impromptu again team so let's see if this is helpful or not 
and maybe I'm looking at the wrong the wrong thing. It doesn't have a seem doesn't doesn't seem to have a time bar on it. Um, I mean anything I don't include now I can include in a different one. Let me read her thing again. She says, scroll down to 1301, you can see the damage to the road from where the lava crossed. It's impressive. And I opened up that link and I see the little video. But it's kind of a weird video and it doesn't have like a, a little time bar that shows where I'm at in the video. Anyway, sorry, I failed on that one, team. Um, What's the probability? Amanda Jo wants to ask from someone here in Iceland with her, what's the probability of a fissure opening inside uh, Grindavik? Well, a volcanic fissure is one thing. We've already had cracks open up, so we have tectonic fissures or cracks that have already opened up in town and they've got all the infrastructure damage there. Um, probability, is it is it possible? Yes. Uh, is it probable based on what we've seen so far? I'd say no, like the probability is low. So hard to say. We would need to see more deformation data that shows that. We would need to see more um, seismic data perhaps as well headed in that area. So oh, go further down the page for the photos to the update at 1301. All right, so now she's, she's trying. Oh, I see what you're saying. Doggone it. Okay, so this is what she was talking about. Sorry, Amanda Joe, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shack. So she wanted, she thought these pictures were pretty uh, impressive here of where the lava flow. Oh yeah. So that's the lava flow chewing up the road. This is great. This is a good point. So thanks for sending that, Amanda Joe. Um, and I had a similar video I could have shown that as well. So where the, remember this is lava, this is not water. So it's dense, it's molten rock, it's hot enough it can move, but it's dense. So as it comes against the road, especially with this little embankment we have on these roadways here, it's actually bulldozing, it's actually pushing down, it's pushing laterally on the, the across the surface, but it's also pushing down and digging into the ground. And so this is a great picture of just how buckled and mangled uh, the roadway is there. So then read the post from the last link I shared about the eruption ending. All right, so Amanda Joe's just running the show here. This is great. Read the post from the last link I shared about the eruption ending. Um, so this says, no vac volcanic activity is visible anymore. The eruption appears to have ended this morning or just over 24 hours after it began. Um, and then they've got the same image we saw earlier. And yeah, just estimation, there was about 10 million square meters of lava. So yeah, so they're calling it kind of like done there, it sounds like. Um, okay. And then, yeah, I think I mentioned the buyout thing. Yeah, it'll be passed into law next week. The government's worked on the issue. The aim is for the bill to be passed at Parliament into law next week. Um, they're setting up a separate finance company, stuff I probably don't understand. Um, the people's real estate will be purchased at a price equal to 95% of the fire compensation assessment, less mortgage debt. Um, so there you go. So that's that's good news. We'll just hope that that happens quickly so folks like Amanda Joe can can move on so um, okay I think I caught all of her stuff there that she wanted me to update you with and I think two hours is a good place to stop so I want to thank everyone for being here today especially um, Susan who was on the moderator uh, I know Lisa was on for a little bit. I think she had to run. So thanks to our moderators and, of course, Amanda Joe, who's now also a moderator. Um, I guess we'll thank the Nightbot, which isn't a person, but a entity. I don't know if it's like AI or whatever, but thank you, Nightbot. We'll just shout out the whole team. Thanks to everyone who sent questions. 
Um, really insightful. I learned a lot. I hope you enjoyed the paper. I will try to, I'll go back to the video description once this gets reposted. Um, I'll, in the next 20 minutes or so, add a lot of these links that I think you might be interested in. So if you want to dive into some of the data, that would be great. Please remember to like, hit the little like button, make sure you subscribe, share this with anyone that you think might find it interesting. Uh, some of these live streams go long. I'll add chapters to it a bit so people can work their way through it in pieces if they want to. So um, I think that's it for now. We'll keep watching as we often do. Um, we'll hope for a good bit of news out of the Icelandic government next week. Uh, hopefully this bill will allow all these displaced residents to finally got, move on with their lives and, and, and basically start over, right? They're, they're losing their homes, their community um, to, for the most part. And so it's still, it's still a sucky situation. It still is tragic on so many levels and it probably doesn't help to just watch this volcano and inflation and these cycles just kind of keep going. Um, it would have been nice to have had everything end and then maybe they could start rebuilding and repairing, but it looks like the town of Grindavik as we know it is in a very geologically hazardous area moving forward. Um, and you know, human occupation there in terms of residence is probably not a good idea uh, in the near term. So, um, so we'll go ahead and call it good for today. Thanks again for everyone's questions. Thanks for joining me here, team, and being part of the geo learning community. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, anything else? Uh, look for some other videos. I'll try to get back to posting some of the, the field-based videos, sort of my bread and butter, keeping an eye on Kilauea a little bit as well. And of course, we'll be back probably, I would guess, you know, sometime next week with another Iceland update. Um, we'll see if we go back into the same cycle we've been in where inflation, we'll watch weeks and weeks of inflation and some activity uh, that may or may not culminate and, in, in, well, probably will culminate in, in an eruption in some area very close to the power plant. So with that, we'll go ahead and sign off. Have a great day. Have a great weekend wherever you are. Thanks again for joining me. I appreciate you and your support and take care. Enjoy.